All right, so. Okay. So our Christian calling is to live, it, live out what the identity Christ has given us through the Holy Spirit. But to be a Christian is to be a renewed human being. So we need to go deeper and ask the question of what it is that we are called to be as human beings. What is our calling as human beings in the world? And once we ask that question, we are confronted with a problem because many Christians experience a split, a disjunction between the ordinary mundane work that we do day by day in our lives and what we call our spiritual lives, focus on devotion to Christ and the worship of God. On the one hand, there are those intense experiences of worship, those communally um, beautiful times when we gather with God's people. We are lost in wonder, overwhelmed with adoration for who God is and thankfulness for what God has done. There are also those times of personal devotions and private prayer where we can become intimate with God. And we know that this kind of worship and devotion, whether communal or individual, is a very important part of our lives in which we open ourselves up to God and to his working in us. But on the other hand, we have all that routine activity of our jobs, the daily commute, the co-workers, or perhaps the students that you have to deal with, the Zoom meetings, the planning, the logistics, the assessment, the incessant emails, and the paperwork, which could be digital or literal, and the bureaucracy. Of course, we sometimes feel as if we are making a real contribution in our work to our profession, maybe to our students, to our field of study, to our society, to the church. We get a sense we're actually helping people. But especially when you've been in a job for a long time, it can begin to feel like a routine, like a burden. And you just have to push on through, as Bob said, in No Woman No Cry. And sometimes we wonder why we are here. Why do we ever choose this job or this profession in the first place? We didn't ask for all the trials that come our way. And even if we don't feel too stressed out about the work, even if we don't get despondent about the workload, we can sometimes feel that the job just doesn't measure up to the importance of what, well, for another better word we call worship. And after all, weren't we created to worship? Our daily work in the world can certainly seem like a pale second best to what we were really made for. But what are we made for? Why are we here? What is our purpose in this marvelous world God has made? Now, the Christian ethicist Alistair McIntyre wrote in a famous book called After Virtue, I can only answer the question, what am I to do? That is my purpose, my moral action in the world. If I can answer the prior question of what story or stories do I find myself a part? So action, moral action, McIntyre says, flows out of who we are, our identity and character, which are in turn shaped by the sort of narrative that we inhabit. Ethics is narratively formed. So the question is this, what kind of narrative is the Christian story? And therefore, what sort of identity and character should it engender? And what sort of action should it impel us to? This means we need to be clear about the story we tell about the world, since this story frames our life and gives it meaning. Another way to put it is we need to be clear about the gospel, because for many Christians, the story that they tell, their version of the gospel is not a full gospel. It is a truncated version of the gospel. Many Christians tell a story of escaping earthly life. In this narrative, the direction of salvation is from earth to heaven. That's the basis of rapture theology. The idea that the saints will be taken from the earth up to heaven while the earth will burn. Now, it doesn't matter whether you believe the rapture is part of a complicated dispensational theological system. Very few people these days still do that. Or as a freestanding idea, which is to, kind of breathed into the church. It kind of be sucked into their by osmosis into our worldview, you know. But it, the point is, it is a narrative of escape. Maybe then rapture is not so important to you. But who could not be moved by the words of that beautiful chorus, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. 
Now, songs like this, and there are many in the Christian tradition, are rooted in a devaluation of earthly life, which God made good. As we're going to see, it is more likely that the things of earth would be clarified, transfigured, maybe even glorified in the light of Christ's glory and grace, rather than growing strangely dim. The story of escape to heaven or transcending the secular world is not just unbiblical, as I'm going to show. It is downright unhelpful because it does not help us to clarify our calling as the image of God in the context of the very real crises in our world today. As police chief Martin Brody said in the movie Jaws, when he saw the size of the shark, you're going to need a bigger boat. Well, we're going to need a bigger story, a story that can encompass all creation and God's amazing purposes for this world and for our lives. We're going to need a full gospel. What is that gospel? What is the core story of the Bible? How do we understand the non-negotiable biblical story? Well, one classic way to summarize it is to say that it moves from creation to fall to redemption. And I think that's basically right. But I want to insert into that the human role, our creation as image of God or the Latin imago dei. So first we need to be clear about creation, God's intentions and purposes for this world. But grounded in that, then we need to grasp the full depth of what it means for us to be God's image. What is our role as human beings in God's purposes? And then we need to reflect upon the fall, how God's purposes have not been fulfilled in human life and in this world. And then we need to explore how scripture goes on to recount salvation or redemption, the story of God setting things right, centered in Messiah, Jesus, culminating in our new, a new heaven and a new earth. In the first two books I, co I wrote, they were co-authored books with a theologian called Brian Walsh. These books are called The Transforming Vision and Truth is Stranger Than It Used to Be. Not my title, the publisher's title, anyway. In these books, we proposed four basic worldview questions. Questions that everyone has at least an implicit answer to. These are not abstract philosophical questions. They are grounding existential questions for human life. And each of these questions corresponds to one of the four points I just mentioned that we need to be clear about. First, the question is, where are we? Well, that's creation. Then who are we? That's being made in God's image. Then what's the problem or what's wrong? That's the fall. And then what's the remedy or the solution? Well, that's redemption. By the way, a total rewrite of my first book, The Transforming Vision, is coming. And the fact that they put a new cover on the book a few years ago, there was nothing really changed in the book. That book is now 39 years old. I wrote it when I was in my 20s, so that will date me. And parts of it came, believe it or not, from term papers I wrote in my last year at JTS. Yes, they found their way to this book. It is still in print, in English, and in five other languages, and for that I thank God. But the book is very much out of date, and people have been asking for a new edition for many years. So I'm going to do a total solo rewrite of this book from scratch, possibly called Dancing in the Dragon's Jaws, the Christian worldview in a conflicted age, and it should be out by the end of next year. I plan to update and deepen the biblical analysis and the cultural implications for our ideologically conflicted world. So you'll be getting a foretaste of this material tonight and tomorrow morning. In the two presentations I'll give, I'm going to take us through the sweep of the biblical story using the four worldview questions as a guide. But in this talk, I'm going to focus on the first two questions primarily. Where are we and who are we? The reason is this. Every telling of the gospel is an attempt to recount the story of sin, the problem, and redemption in Christ, the remedy. But in our understandings of the gospel, the initial narrative thrust, the way the, the story begins, is often only implicit. We don't have a conscious understanding of it. And, but this initial narrative thrust involves God's original intent for earthly life and our purpose as human beings in God's world. This means we have to reflect explicitly on creation and the image of God at the beginning of the story, 
Because if we do not understand God's original intent, we will misunderstand what went wrong. We'll especially misunderstand the nature of redemption or salvation, how God is setting things right. And it will also affect how we live in the world. In both the talks today and tomorrow, I'm going to take us on a very deep dive into scripture. So prepare yourselves. You might be overwhelmed because you might not realize the Bible is so profound. But I believe it's an amazing vision that can inspire us. In each talk, the point will not be just to overwhelm me with ideas, rather to reflect on the implications of these ideas for Christian living in the contemporary world. All right, you ready? We're going to dive in now. So let's start with the first question. Where are we? What is the nature of creation, the world that we find ourselves in? Specifically, what does scripture say about creation, about the world we live in? Let's start with John 3, 16, the most well-known and perhaps best-loved verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. God loved the world, the cosmos in Greek. Could that mean what we mean today by the cosmos, the universe, all the galaxies, the earth itself? And all the life forms on earth? Well, the Gospel of John couldn't be referring to our modern conceptions of the universe. That would be anachronistic, reading modern ideas back into the Bible. That's called eisegesis. You don't do that, right? But could John 3.16 mean that God loves the entire cosmos as it was understood in biblical times? The world picture that we find both in Genesis 1 and in many other biblical texts seems to assume a flat earth founded upon the waters, the netherworld or underworld somewhere down there, either in or below the subterranean waters, and at the extremities of the earth were the pillars, the distant mountains which were thought to go down to the underworld and up to the sky, holding up and supporting the dome of the heavens, which the, the King James calls the firmament because it was firm, and it held back the cosmic waters, you know, so the floodgates of heaven opened and the waters came in during the flood. So, in other words, the Bible understands the world, along with the many cultures of the ancient Near East, as a building. It has a flat floor, it has a basement, it's a flooded basement, there's a roof overhead, there are either walls or pillars at the sides holding it up. That is the ancient world picture or cosmology that the Bible shares with many cultures of the ancient world. That's why we find biblical texts that assume a parallel between God's creation of the world and the building of a house. Proverbs 3 tells us that the Lord by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the deeps broke open and the clouds dropped down the dew. This is the same heaven and earth that God created according to Genesis 1. And these, these verses describe the well-watered universe of heaven and earth, established by God's wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. And the Hebrew terms here, Chachma, Tevona, and Da'at are pretty much synonyms. They mean that God used wisdom when he established it. He had a good plan. He had an architectonic scheme. Now, a few chapters later in Proverbs, we are told that these same three wisdom terms are characteristic of a well-built house. By wisdom, a house is built. And by understanding, it is established. By knowledge, the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. So these two texts speak of a well-designed building. The cosmos, the world, is a building. It's a metaphor. It's a perceptual metaphor. Let's not take it too literally. But these texts speak of a well-designed building that is appropriately finished or furnished. It is filled with what it needs to be. And so these two passages from Proverbs replicate the two panels of creation in Genesis 1. You have days 1 through 3, where God structures the world forms regions of light and dark, separates sky and earth from primal waters. Then you have days four through six, where God populates the regions he has made with the creatures appropriate to them. First, the structure is described. Then you could say the furnishing of the house is mentioned. Furthermore, the Hebrew terms behind founded and established, these terms used in Proverbs, are architectural terms. 
and even the New Testament still retain some language about the foundation of the world. Although some modern translations like the NIV, the New International Version, seems to think it's a dead metaphor. And so just renders it as the creation or the beginning of the world. But a metaphor of the founding of the, the building of the universe was very much alive in the Old Testament. So when God questions Job, his description draws upon architectural imagery. Let's take a look at Job 38. Where were you, God asked Job, when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God, the angels, shouted for joy? See, Genesis 1 not only agrees with the ancient Near Eastern world picture of the world as a building or a house, but with the fact that the house was meant to be inhabited both by humans and a variety of other creatures too. The Bible is very clear that the earth is meant to be the home for human beings. As Psalm 115 puts it, and I'll come back to this passage a little later, the heavens are the Lord's heavens, but the earth he has given to human beings. That's consistent with the biblical understanding of human beings as earth creatures made from the earth. As Genesis 2.7 tells us, the Lord God formed a human, Adam, from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and a human became a living being. The very name Adam, which is also the word for human in Hebrew, is a pun or wordplay on the Hebrew word for ground or soil. God formed the human, Ha-Adam, from the ground, Ha-Adama. In English, we might have a contemporary pun. We say God made a human from the humus, that is from the soil itself. This means that from the very beginning of the Bible, it should be clear that the old hymn is mistaken when it says, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. We're not just passing through on our way to our heavenly destination. This created world, this earth is meant to be our home. But we can dig deeper. We can dig deeper into the, the idea of the world as a building to explore its theological significance. And one way to explore the significance of this picture is to ask, what kind of building is God making? And I want to look at three Psalms, Psalms 29, 150, and 148. Now, Psalm 29 is an intriguing creation psalm. It pictures a storm coming from the Mediterranean into Israel, actually north of Israel, into Lebanon. But it's not a naturalistic or scientific account of a storm. It's a storm theophany, a manifestation of God, where the booming thunder is the voice of the Lord. Indeed, God rides on the storm, much like the God Baal is thought to do in Canaanite religion. And as the storm makes landfall with booms of thunder and flashes of lightning, which are called flames of fire here, the wilderness and the forest shake and tremble at God's appearing. And all in God's temple say, glory. Now you could take this in a very anthropocentric, that is a human-centered sense, to mean that when the worshippers down south in the Jerusalem temple hear the storm, they're in awe of God. But Jerusalem is very far from Lebanon, which is north of Israel. You probably couldn't even hear the storm from there. It more likely means that in the forest, which is the temple of creation, where the theophany is occurring, the animals respond appropriately to God. Now this makes sense of Psalm 150. Because the very first verse of this psalm identifies the firmament with God's sanctuary. It's not the Jerusalem temple. It's the sky that's God's sanctuary. And the last verse calls on everything that has breath, not just human beings, to praise the Lord. That's pretty, pretty amazing. And then there is Psalm 148, a particularly wonderful creation psalm describing what, in effect, is a cosmic worship service. And in this worship service is not even limited to those with breath. So in Psalm 148, we are told, praise the Lord from the heavens. And then we read about a list of heavenly creatures who are called to praise the Lord, including the angelic host, all the heavenly bodies, the sun, moon, and stars, the very highest heavens, and the waters above the heavens. 
But not only heavenly creatures are called on to worship God. Praise the Lord from the earth, we read in verse 7. And then follows a list of earthly creatures, including sea monsters and deep oceans, meteorological phenomena like lightning, hail, snow, wind, which we are told is obedient to God. The wind obeys God's command. And mountains, trees, animals, birds, and finally, people too. Yes, I didn't move forward. Yes, people also, human beings, are called to worship God, but they're not the only worshipers in creation. We are mentioned in only two out of 12 verses that call on God's heavenly and earthly creatures to worship him. Creation in this picture is nothing less than a cosmic sanctuary or temple. That's the kind of building we're getting at. It's a world in which every creature is called upon to respond to their creator with appropriate praise. Hope I'm lost you yet. Ready to dig some deep, deep wells into scripture now? Let's go further. It is this vision of creation as a cosmic sanctuary that underlies the parallel drawn in the Bible between the world, the cosmos, and the tabernacle in the wilderness. There are three particular parallels I want to draw attention to. First, when God called Bezalel to oversee the construction of the tabernacle in Exodus 31, God filled him with wisdom, understanding, and knowledge so he would do a good job. Remember that God made the universe by his wisdom. Proverbs 3 uses the very same three wisdom terms. So Bezalel, in his wife's craftsmanship, is the image of God. But even more, just as Bezalel was constructing a sacred edifice for God to dwell with his people, this suggests that the world God made, heaven and earth, is meant to be a mega-sized tabernacle or temple in which God desires to dwell with all his creatures. That's the first parallel. The second parallel is that God filled Bezalel with the Spirit of God, Ruach Elohim the same spirit that was hovering over the waters at the start of creation in Genesis. And the third parallel is with God's spirit and wisdom, Bezalel was able to do every kind of craft, kol melacha in Hebrew, a phrase which is almost identical to something that occurs when God rests from doing all his work, kol melakto. The parallels between the construction of the tabernacle and the creation of the world are well recognized in Old Testament studies. And they suggest that if we ask the question, what kind of world is God making in Genesis? What kind of building is this? The answer is crystal clear. God is creating a cosmic sanctuary, a holy place, a temple. No wonder Isaiah 66 questions why any human being would bother building a temple or earthly house for God. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne, Earth is my footstool. What is this house you build for me? And what is my resting place? All these things my hand has made. And so all these things are mine, says the Lord. God has already built his own house or temple, the universe. Why would you need to construct sacred space to worship God when all space is already sacred? This world, heaven and earth, is meant to be God's temple. Now, in the cosmic temple of creation, the sky or heaven, is quite literally inaccessible to human beings. It is transcendent in the technical meaning of that word, which means it is beyond us. That's why heaven becomes a symbol in the Bible for God's place, where the creator has his throne, from which he rules the entire earth. The idea of heaven as a location of God's throne is illustrated by the vivid picture in Exodus 24 of Moses, Aaron, and the elders of Israel, who went up Mount Sinai at God's invitation and saw the God of Israel, that a vision of God. Under his feet, there was something like a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. Or in another translation, under his feet was something like a pavement made of lapis lazuli, as bright blue as the sky. What is this clear or bright structure under God's throne? The dome of the heaven, because God is enthroned above heaven or in the heavens. And even when the image is not so vividly portrayed as in Exodus 24, heaven as the location of God's throne is a pervasive theme in the Bible, especially in the Psalms. One of many biblical Psalms that mentions this is Psalm 103, 
the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Or Psalm 11, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his gaze examines humankind. Now in the Bible, heaven and earth together are understood as a macrocosmic supersized version of the tabernacle or Jerusalem temple. In this picture, heaven as God's throne is parallel to the Holy of Holies in the Jerusalem temple where God dwells. But heaven is part of the created world in the Bible. I know, I know, that's not the way many Christians think about heaven, but we're trying to be biblical here. This is the biblical worldview. In the biblical view, heaven as a seat of God's throne means God has chosen to indwell part of the cosmos, the transcendent part. After all, in the beginning, God made the heaven and the earth. So paradoxically, the notion of God's throne in heaven from which he rules the earth is an image not only of God's transcendence, that he's beyond us and above us, but also of God's imminence, that he has come to be with us. All right, that's heaven. Let's go to earth now. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Earth is the distinctively human realm. I quoted Psalm 115 a little earlier. The heavens are the Lord's heavens, but the earth he has given to human beings. If heaven is the holy of holies in the cosmic temple, earth is the holy place, the place where we offer our bodies as living sacrifices, as Paul puts it in Romans 12.1. That is our true and proper worship. So what kind of embodied worship are we supposed to offer God in the temple of creation? And this leads to the question of who are we? What is the role and purpose of human beings in God's world? So let's examine what scripture says about the human calling, the human vocation. Now let's start with Genesis 1, then we go to Genesis 2, Psalm 8, and Psalm 104, looking at four texts. In Genesis 1, the human purpose is portrayed as representing or imaging God on earth. We are made in God's image and likeness. We are imago dei, to use the Latin, image of God. And this imaging of God is integrally tied to our God-given dominion or rule in the earthly realm. According to Genesis 1.26, God says, let us make humanity in our image according to our likeness so that they might rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth and over all the creatures that move along the ground. And this human purpose to exercise power among the animals is repeated in verse 28, combined with the task of subduing the earth. Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, the birds in the sky, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. We are commissioned to have dominion over animal life and to subdue the earth. Twin tasks that in their original context referred to animal husbandry, that's rule over the earth, that's rule over the animals, and agriculture, that is to subdue the earth. These aspects of farming are foundational to the development of complex human culture. And Psalm 8 picks up on the first of these tasks, dominion over animals. This Psalm views dominion as equivalent to being crowned with glory and honor. Since God is the creator and ultimate ruler of all things, human dominion on earth is equivalent to being made God-like, a little lower than Elohim, little lower than God. That's parallel to the image of God in Genesis 1. Genesis 2 picks up on the second of the two tasks, farming or agriculture, and focuses on humans tilling and keeping or working and protecting the garden. The garden is an agricultural project that God himself began. The Lord God planted the garden. And God expects humans to continue work in it. That is an image of God theme. We continue God's work in the world. Even after we are expelled from the garden, we expect it to continue working the land the ground outside the garden. Now, Psalm 105, also 104, likewise highlights agricultural pro prowess that humans have in the way it contrasts humans with cattle. Although God gives grass to cattle and plants to humans, cattle are content just to eat the grass that God gives. But what do humans do? We cultivate the plants. Through our ingenuity, we become farmers and we turn grapes into wine olives into oil, and wheat into bread. 
for our sustenance and enjoyment. By this twofold emphasis on agriculture and animal husbandry, which are foundational to complex social organization, scripture grounds the development of all aspects of human culture, technology, and civilization in God's primal commission to humanity. This is the pre-fall cultural mandate that God gives those made in his image. It precedes, it comes before the degradation and difficulty of work that is a result of sin and the curse that is on work according to Genesis 3. It is the original human mission to exercise power and agency in the world in such a way that we transform our earthly environment by our labor into a complex sociocultural, even urban world, which includes high technology, music, philosophy, the study of human cultures throughout history, and the scientific enterprise. They attempt to understand how God's world works. The image of God grounds the human calling to make sense of the world, to understand it by making something of the world, to transform it, as Andy Crouch puts it in his book, Culture Making. This involves understanding the wisdom of God embedded in creation and developing all sorts of wise cultural innovations in a manner that glorifies God and manifests God's lordship over the earth. Clearly, we have moved beyond agriculture and animal husbandry to something that the Bible itself is aware of. So Genesis 4 reports the building of the first city or town, probably the word settlement might be a better term, the first human settlement by an ordinary human being. Genesis 4 also mentions the human invention of livestock herding, nomadic livestock herding. It also mentions the beginning of musical instruments, which I think is a wonderful thing, and the development of metal tools. When I was a JTS student in the final year of my BTH degree, I began to reflect on why Genesis 4 reported on such ordinary supposedly secular activities in the early human history as if they were important. Well, the thing is, they are. Because if you're going to till and keep the garden of creation, you might want to develop some technologies and practices to help you do this more efficiently. And the fact that such cultural practices and products came into being in God's world is due, says Genesis, to ordinary people like you and me exercising their cultural power as the image of God and we are brought into being not just city building, musical instruments, livestock rearing, and metal uh, tools. We've also brought into being nation states, systems of trade and economic exchange, works of visual art, love poetry, dub poetry, track and field athletics, both male and female, and praise the Lord, reggae music. Do I hear amen? All right. Now, the Bible suggests, you see, that creation was never meant to be static. When God made the world, it was good. Indeed, it was very good. But its full potential was not yet unleashed. God expected change and development as we human beings work to unfold the vast possibilities of earthly life. This makes sense of a problem, a conundrum that I have been struggling with for many years, had me stumped initially. You see, in the book of Exodus, when the building of the tabernacle was finished in Exodus 40, we are told this was filled with the glory presence of God, what later Jewish writers would call the Shekinah. We sometimes say the Shekinah glory. So pronounce it right, Shekinah. The same is true of the temple when it was completed. It was filled with God's glorious presence. So I therefore wondered why the Bible does not likewise portray the entire earth as presently filled with God's presence if it is meant to be the cosmic sanctuary that God intended? Why does God dwell with his throne in heaven and the earth no more than a footstool? Now, part of the answer, of course, is human sin, right? Our mismanagement of our vocation. We have rebelled against God. But it's not that sin has driven God's presence out from creation or earthly life. That is too simplistic. We need a more developmental interpretation that fits the creation accounts in the Bible. It's not clear from scripture that God intended his presence to fill creation automatically. Genesis 1, 2 tells us that at the beginning, God's spirit or breath, God's ruach, was hovering over creation as if God was getting ready to 
breathe his presence into the world. Yet when Genesis 1 finishes and creation is complete and the beginning of Genesis 2 comes and God rests from having created, there is no account of God filling the world with his presence or his spirit or his glory, even though there is no sin. Instead, God breathes into a human being made from the dust of the ground, Genesis 2, 7, which makes the human come alive. It turns out that this is an echo of an ancient Mesopotamian ritual known as the washing or opening of the mouth, by which it was thought that the gods put their spirit or breath into a carved statue, a cult image, and it would come alive, and then it was placed in a temple. Just like in Genesis 2, the div this divine inbreathing was thought to take place in a sacred garden, and then the image was put in a temple. The result of this ritual process, this divine inbreathing, is the image of a god. So Genesis 2-7 is actually a polemical argument against paganism. It is human beings, not carved idols or cult statues, that are the authorized image of God on earth. So it turns out that while only Genesis 1 explicitly uses the image of God terminology, Genesis 1 and 2 are in profound harmony because they both understand human beings as the site of God's presence in the world. God is present through us and our actions. Idols are false images. They are impotent to boot. They can do nothing. But humans are powerful living images of the one true God called to the sacred task of manifesting God's presence by everything we do on earth. Our mission is a priestly one, a sacred one. By our faithful representation of God, who is enthroned in the heavens, we are meant to extend the presence of this divine ruler from heaven to earth to prepare the earth for the full eschatological presence of God, which will happen at the last day. We are to be nothing less than God's prism in the world, taking the concentrated light of the creator and refracting that brilliance into a complex variety of cultural activities that scintillate and shine with the glory of God. Brother Thompson, were you about to say something? No, all right, good. So humans have a very high calling created as we are in God's image, but there is a problem. And so we come to the third worldview question. I spent quite a bit of time on the first and second worldview question. Where are we and who are we? I'll run through quite quickly how this provides a foundation for understanding the rest of the story. So the third question basically is, and I should have gone forward a little bit, what's wrong with the world? What's gone wrong? The problem is, of course, that sin, the disobedient exercise of cultural power, with which God has gifted us, has blocked the developmental task of being God's image and led to the desecration of our earthly home. Notice that the issue is power, the exercise of agency for good or ill. The Bible here seems very modern because it addresses issues that are relevant to today. Power is a fundamental question. Violence is the violation, the use of power for evil. But this, the Bible is always relevant, you see. And from the primal disobedience of Genesis 3, where humans transgress their God-given limits, to the first murder of brother by brother narrated in Genesis 4, we have misused the power to image God. And so we've shut the earth off from God's full presence, which led C.S. Lewis in one of his novels to call earth the silent planet, cut off from commerce with the heavens. And human violence, the misuse of the power God has given us, escalates in Genesis 4 with Lamech, who is the first bigamist. He initiates this particular form of violence against women, and he engages in the revenge killing of a youth who injured him and boasts about it to his two, two wives. And the violence spirals out of control until in Genesis 6, we are told the earth was filled with it. When God looked at the world in Genesis 1, he saw it was very good. But after the violence had been accumulating on earth, God looks again. And what does God see? He sees that the earth has been corrupted or ruined by us, by human beings. And this violence is given as a reason for the flood. God is going to make a fresh start with Noah and his family. But the rest of scripture, the history of the world and our own experience all testify to the fact that nothing much has changed. We have not yet been cured of our violence. We live in a world that glorifies violence. 
God wants the glory presence, his cloud of glory to fill the earth. And we have filled the earth with what? Nuclear weapons. And that's not a, that is not the Shekinah cloud, you know, it's a different kind of cloud. No wonder God's presence has never fully filled the earth. But my sisters and brothers, the good news, the gospel, is that God has never given up on creation. Not the God of the scriptures anyway. It is God's intent that his presence extend from heaven to earth, to conform earth to heaven. That's why the Lord taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is God's purpose for earthly life. When the people of Israel refused to enter the promised land at Kadesh Barnea because of the supposed giants they saw in the land, God promised this would not prevent his purpose, which was that all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. And the later psalmist in Psalm 20, 72 puts it this way, Blessed be God's glorious name forever. May his glory fill the whole earth. And the prophets Habakkuk and Isaiah envision a day when the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in the New Testament, Ephesians 4 tells us that at the ascension of Christ from the earth, he didn't leave forever. He's going to come back, and when he comes back, he will fill all things. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul tells us that after Christ has conquered death on the last day and handed the kingdom over to the Father, God will be all in all. This is temple language, people, when God's glory and presence will fill creation, saturate the world. But how is God going to bring this about? How will God repair what's gone wrong with earthly life? And to accomplish his purpose, the Shekinah, the Shekinah, had to come first in a man, Jesus, who scripture describes as the womb become flesh. God with us, Emmanuel. Jesus is the paradigm of the image of God. He is the decisive sight of God's presence, come to offer us new life. Although we of Adam's race were created to be God's image, we have failed in our priestly vocation to be the bond between heaven and earth. But this vocation was fulfilled faithfully by none other than the second Adam, Jesus the Messiah, who completely manifested God's character and presence in his life. And through the obedience of Jesus, even to his death on a cross, our tragic failure has been reversed. And the risen Christ now is the head of an international community of Jew and Gentile, reconciled to each other and to God, and indwelt by God's very Shekinah. The church, says Paul, is the new humanity, the new human race, renewed in the image and likeness of God. We are meant to be a restart on the image of God, that we might become what humans were really meant to be from the beginning. No wonder Paul goes on to call the church God's temple. Don't you know that God's spirit dwells in you? We are the dwelling place of God. And the spirit is the foretaste of the future that is coming that we can only barely imagine. When we turn to the last chapters of Revelation, we catch a glimpse of what that future will be like. Revelation 22 tells us that on that day, the curse will be removed from the earth, a reversal of Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. And a voice from the throne announces that the ancient promise of God's presence is coming to fruition. God's dwelling place is now among human beings, and he will dwell with them. They will be his peoples, and God will be with them and be their God. Notice the voice comes from God's throne. But where is this throne located? from which the voice comes. In the Old Testament, we have the consistent claim that God rules the earth from his throne in the heavens, the cosmic holy of holies. But in Revelation 21 and 22, God's throne is now in the midst of the new Jerusalem, which has descended from heaven to earth. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city. The center of God's governance of the universe has now decisively shifted from heaven to the renewed earth because the destiny of the cosmic temple is complete. The kingdom has come on earth as in heaven, and earth has been conformed to heaven. And the New Jerusalem, which is both a holy city and the people of God, the bride of Christ, is described very strangely as a cube. Its length and width and height are equal. It is no coincidence that a cube is a distinctive shape of the Holy of Holies in the Jerusalem temple, 
where God dwelt with his people. That was a pretty small cube. This is a big one. So in the redeemed world to come, in the temple of rede renewed creation, God's people themselves are the concentrated center of his presence, which will then fill the earth. After the glory of God filled the Jerusalem temple at its completion in 1 Kings 8, Solomon pondered God's condescension to dwell with Israel and asked in amazement, but will God really dwell on earth? The heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built. Today, we have a much clearer understanding of how immense the heavens are, so we can appreciate Solomon's words even more. Yet God has condescended not just to dwell in heaven, not just to dwell on earth in the tabernacle and temple. It is the audacious claim of the New Testament that the Creator became incarnate in Jesus of Nazareth, the second Adam who accomplished through his obedience to death what the first failed to do through disobedience. And through the life, death, and resurrection of the Messiah, we can expect nothing less than the redemption of the world, a new heaven and a new earth. And that new world will be so radical, says John, that it is like the old heaven and old earth just passed away. Does that mean that God will obliterate the universe and replace it with something totally discontinuous? No, no more than creation. Conversion to Christ means that God wipes us out and replaces us with a duplicate. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, new creation. You know, he was so excited. He left out the verb in Greek. The old has passed away. The new has come. Both John and Paul can say that the old has passed away. Because in both cases, the, the transformation is quite radical. And if this is the Bible's end state vision, a renewed creation, flooded with God's presence, grounded in God's intent for a good earth, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, the incarnate word who has taken into himself on the cross, the poison of our sin and violence, to give it back to us as redemption. If that is the vision that animates our lives, how does this shape our identity and character? We who claim to follow Jesus Christ, who is the creator and redeemer, as we live between the times. I've been saying of late that ethics is lived eschatology. Eschatology is, of course, the name for your, the end state vision you have of the world. But if the vision of scripture grips our lives, then our human calling is nothing less than to extend the presence of God from heaven to earth in and through all that we do as redeemed human beings in the temple of creation. This applies to our work, to our family life, to our friendships, to our education, to our participation in the church, to our consumer activities, to our entertainment, to how we engage in civic society, to our interactions on social media. It applies to whatever we do day by day, living as God's image and manifesting God's presence on earth, in earthly life cannot be limited to so-called secular or sacred activities. God's presence is to be manifested through everything that we do. There is nothing secular in this world. It is a sacred temple of God. Our day-to-day -day work may seem mundane sometimes, but it's our offering to God of worship in the temple of creation. And if we are faithful in our tasks, we'll fulfill our calling and become agents of healing in a hurting and needy world, manifesting God's holy presence in the temple of creation, even in the Caribbean and in Jamaica, land we love. Thank you very much. Dr. Middleton, we thank you for your presentation this evening. You warned us that it would have been a sweeping overview of the biblical story, and you really delivered. I would like to take this time for any questions individuals may have. I want to thank, while you're thinking of your questions, I see one hand already raised. I want to thank Love 101 FM for allowing this presentation to be available to the wider public. And I don't know how much longer they will be with us here, but let's take some questions. I see a Dane Nelson with a hand raised. I'm gonna give him an opportunity now to ask his question to Dr. Middleton. Good evening to everyone on the platform and wider society. Good evening, Dr. Middleton. Thank you for that intriguing presentation. I have one question. 
with regards to the diagram that you had presented of the earth with heaven above and earth beneath, you made a mention that um, where God is sitting, you said that he is sitting on the dome of heaven. So I wanted to be clear if you meant dome of earth or if it is dome of heaven, could you explain why you right. would have said earth? So, you know, my talk was going to be a little bit longer and I had some clarification of this point, but we had to cut it shorter because we had a, a longer time period originally when it was going to be in person and we cut it short a little bit. So, so what I was going to say was that this world picture is not a very precise picture. It is an impression that people have of the world, that the sky is overhead and God is above because God is transcendent. So you'll find some texts that say God is in heaven, but you also have some that say that God's throne is upon the heavens. So th th that is a dome of heaven, the, the, what, it, what is called the firmament in the King James Version, right? Um, the Hebrew word is rakia, which means something solid that you is beaten out like a semi-transparent dome. So God is, the, the point is, don't take it very literally, mm -hmm. right? It is a metaphor to say God is beyond us, above us, but God sees everyone from his throne in heaven. When the Gospel of Matthew prefers to use the term kingdom of heaven rather than kingdom of God, it is using it for that purpose, that God is a universal ruler of all the world. Or when in the book of Daniel or other places, Daniel says God is a God of heaven. That means God is not just in Jerusalem. God has sovereignty over Nebuchadnezzar also can make him eat grass, right? God is a universal ruler over all things. That's the point of the image. And I don't want to go much further than that with um, okay. details, but... That makes right, sense. Thank you for that clarity. Yes, thank you for that clarity. Good. I see Jeremy having a hand raised. Go ahead, Jeremy. Yes. Good evening, um, Dr. Middleton. Uh, I have a little question. Um, well, I must say thank you for the presentation. I really um learned some stuff. But my question is, and I've been thinking about this question for a little while. Um, how old is the earth from a biblical perspective? I know that mm -hmm. scientists have been giving some figures, and I would like to hear from you your biblical yeah. position on that, the, right. earth, uh, the, the scientist theory, and from a biblical background. Right. So one of the things that I had to cut out was a distinction between a world picture and a worldview. The terms world picture and worldview come from the German. World picture is Weltbild and worldview is Weltanschauung. You may have heard those terms. It doesn't really matter. But the world picture is the phenomenological description of what it looks like to, the, to you, when you when you live in the world. The world view is the abiding theological vision that is being communicated that when we move from viewing the earth as flat with a dome overhead to viewing the world as a sphere, with concentric circles around it in which were diverse planets and the sun moving. That was the medieval idea. They took the same worldview and applied it to that picture. And when we started to use telescopes and so on and had the idea that there's a heliocentric universe, the, the, the planets go around the sun and, this, you know, and, and the moon go around the earth, we could still apply the same worldview to that new scientific world picture. I do not absolutize the ancient world picture and say we must make our science depend on it. Science is, the, the whole scientific enterprise was actually generated by people who believe the biblical worldview, that God made the world and put his wisdom in the world and gave us wisdom as his image that we could study the world. And as they studied it, they came to realize the world is actually quite old and the universe is quite big. That may contradict on a surface level, the world picture in Genesis, that doesn't really matter. The point is the worldview is what is theologically important. And that worldview that the world is meant to be the holy place where all creatures serve God. And even the stars as they, they sing in their glory to praise the Lord and all the animals of the earth. You know, Psalm 96, the Lord, the Lord is coming to judge the earth. So let all the earth rejoice. May the hills sing with praise and the rivers clap their hands because God is coming to bring judgment and righteousness. So the world the whole point is, I'm not going to be looking and seeing for him if mountains are actually singing in oral tunes. I get the theological point that the world will re be renewed and be positively rejoicing because God is going to set things right. So the world view is different from the world picture. See if that helps, but if not, you can follow it up with a further question. 
Very good. Yeah. I see we have uh, Ms. Erica Campbell. Hand is raised. Go ahead, Ms. Campbell. Hi, sir. All right, Dr. Middleton. Um, yes, the love one. Um, how, how, would, would you, how would you respond to someone who raises Colossians 3, 1 to 4 as a counter argument to yours? Um, I have it open here. Um, since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Right, right. That is one of my favorite texts. So in my so, book, no, can, my, yes. okay, in my book, A New Heaven and a New Earth, Reclaiming Biblical Eschatology, I have a whole section on these New Testament texts that have been read as if, if we should not pay attention to earth, but move to heaven. But the point is this, there, there's many texts that say that our life is hid with Christ in God, right? That our citizenship is in heaven, that we are waiting a city from heaven that our salvation is being kept for us in heaven, that we have an inheritance reserved for us in heaven. This is a complex theme throughout the New Testament. But the point is that you don't go to heaven to receive the inheritance. The inheritance comes to earth at the last day to transform the world. And the image is that heaven is really important in the biblical worldview. Not just the physical heaven, but the metaphor of heaven as a place of transcendence where earthly things cannot corrupt. So, my identity is in Christ. My identity is, you know, partially the fact that I'm a Jamaican who has become a Canadian, become an American, um, and I'm a male, and I can go into all these things. But my true identity is in Christ. And that is not an earthly thing, not a heavenly thing. And that is higher than and applies to every identity I have on earth. So I think a text like Colossians 3 is saying, do not let your mind be guided by earthly perspectives which are fallen but focus on the biblical perspective of Christ, but bring that to earth and connect it to earth so that we see the world differently and we act differently. And then the earth starts to become the kingdom of God through our actions. So earthly can, the way I've been using it is the good created world, but earthly can also mean the fallen world. And that should not be the center of our attention. Just as you have God so loved the world, but you have in 1 John, do not love the world. That is the world qua fallen, not the world that is good. So we have to make that distinction. That may not help you, but if it doesn't, come back and ask some more. Yes, it helps. Okay. Very good. I'm going to take uh, present the last question for this evening, as we initially planned to be here until 7.30. It's now 7.35. The question I'd like us to leave with, what is the role of an institution like JTS? in reviving the original purpose of human beings in the world. You're going to open that up to everybody, right? Of course I will. <laughs> <laughs> you know, especially since you are the president and, you know, we were students together and I have not been a part of JTS over all these years. I've been connected. You know more about where the institution is going right now. And maybe you could try to answer that question for us. Very good. So JTS at the moment is engaging in a type of uh, review of its identity and its place in this matter of renewing the original purpose of human beings. Hence our lecture for this evening, created in the image of God, the Christian worldview and character formation. We're trying to determine for ourselves the role we play in a place like Jamaica, with all of the crime that we hear about and the violence and individuals experiencing trauma of every kind, what role do we play in reshaping, in imaging God in a way that would reflect the peace and the harmony that human beings desire and yearn for? 
I think JTS has a place. I think we are pursuing it with some amount of rigor and enthusiasm. We're calling on our friends in the wider community to join us, work with us as we seek to serve our land, serve the region, continuing the vision and the mission that Dr. Zenas Gehrig had originally in forming this institution. May we take the challenge. I think uh, you uh, have placed one on our lips for this evening, right in front of us to assist ourselves in seeing the role we play in reforming, in revitalizing that original mission for which God created us as human beings. Those four questions you raised are very pertinent. They are significant. I'd like to invite my friends this evening to return tomorrow morning at 